and incentivizing and crowding in finance uh, for the adoption and scaling of practices and technologies which help crop farmers, uh, livestock keepers, and the like to be able to hit these social, economic, as well as environmental goals is something that is very much of interest to our project managers. And um, I also believe to the project managers of our sister institutions, some of which we will get an opportunity to interact with um, um, today. And, and as they say, of course, um, you can't manage what you can't measure. And I would add, um, what you cannot track and what you cannot account for, uh, which then means that uh, accounting methods become very important to encourage and build confidence for investments in activities that enhance soil health and also to help demonstrate impact. Um, and in this way, we can then drive even more investment uh, towards this agenda and also to enhance the adoption of the kind of practices that really help in that. Um, so um, we're really glad to have the diverse group of actors within soil carbon accounting that we have assembled here today, uh, you know, ranging from soil scientists uh, to agriculture companies, to development project managers, to fund managers, uh, climate finance experts, um, and the like, and um, which we hope will really result in a very engaging and rich discussion, which is mutually beneficial to all. Um, and so as I welcome you um, and hand over to my colleague, uh, Chinuro from CCAPS, uh, to give us a quick recap on uh, the key um, outcomes from the first day session, the webinar that I mentioned earlier. I would like to just take a few seconds to also just acknowledge uh, our colleagues and the team that has really worked very hard to put uh, this special format of a hackathon together which had been initially uh, conceived as a face-to-face -face event. Um, that's our colleagues from, from CCAPS, uh, the Nature Conservancy, uh, for 4.1000, uh, Meridian Institute, as well as my colleagues uh, from the World Bank uh, to also just say thank you. Um, and most importantly, to say thank you to, uh, to you all for joining us today and uh, availing your time as well as your expertise uh, in this agenda that we think is very, very important. Um, I thank you and with that, I will hand over to Chinero. Uh, thank you so much, um, Kulumo, for these uh, words. So uh, Madeline, could you please um, put the presentation? So uh, my name is Chinero Costa Jr. and I work for CCAPS and uh, now I got, I'm going to present a um, brief summary of the webinar uh, we had uh, one week ago exactly, right? So in this occasion, we had the, the pleasure of listening to 11 talks, including uh, three keynotes and eight uh, state-of-art initiatives. So in session uh, one, participants uh, greatly uh, set the scene uh, for this topic by presenting, uh, one, the necessity of a low cost and reliable soil carbon accounting system in order to leverage public and private finance towards uh, carbon projects. Two, uh, they showed real ground level interventions leading to soil carbon sequestration uh, with examples from uh, Colombia, uh, Kenya, and the, the US. And uh, they also showed how um, an MRV for soil carbon should look like for meeting this project and financial demands. So on the second part of the, the, the webinar we had last week, these panelists, these eight panelists, they, they, they covered actions across private and public uh, sectors uh, at local and global scales. So for example, we heard about partnerships uh, with farmers uh, on activity data collection. Some of these initiatives uh, coupling uh, soil measurements, uh, modeling, as well as payment for a, a carbon that is sequestered in soils. Uh, we also heard about MRV components improvements. So for example, we heard about uh, uh, technical guidance on aggregation for uh, carbon projects and also uh, talking about uh, reversals uh, risk. So there are improvements in these fields as well. Uh, these talks were complemented by remote sensing uh, applications in market uh, place uh, developments. Uh, we also saw in much larger scale, the MRV 
and uh, the carbon market established by the Australian government, for example. And finally, we, uh, we saw the global uh, uh, engagement effort, FAO, FAO is doing through the REC soils, right? So from these uh, 11 presentations, we uh, drew some takeaways uh, to guide us today. So ne next slide, please. Okay, good. Uh, so that from, from the financial sector perspective, it's clear uh, the need for an accurate and low cost approach that can provide uh, a rational for uh, the use of public and private funds. So from the, the, the financial sector perspective, the message was around, look, it doesn't need to be perfect, but reliable, right? So given that, how to make it practical and viable? So one option would be through a, an integrated approach for measurement, modeling, and activity data. So in order to do so, three actions uh, could be taken. So the first one, focus on a few high quality direct measurements. So by basically by setting field measurements in key regions and key management conditions for better understanding effects of practice on the soil, soil carbon stocks. Second, these data could be used in the calibration of models for accounting at scale, right? And finally, we should enhance the capability to incorporate farm level activity data. So basically by strengthening the ability for farmers and the practitioners to provide data at, and, and test management options uh, ahead using supporting uh, uh, systems such as uh, platforms. And, and last but not the least, we should also take into consideration aspects of accounting designs and infrastructure around this topic for ensuring the integrity of the accounting systems. So it means that we should look also at components that sit beyond the measurement itself, especially in the risk of permanence, right? So uh, very brief, I stop there and I hope these messages can help us out today's session and uh, I wish you all a great deep dive day. So team, uh, over to you, please. Thank you. <coughs> uh, hello there, um, Tim Mealy uh, with the Meridian Institute and my colleague Madeline Smith and I are uh, supporting this effort and both facilitation and uh, with the technical support for Zoom. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, everyone has gotten past the the first hurdle of, of getting on the Zoom site, we're still um, sending out my link to, uh, to those who haven't uh, received the private uh, email from Zoom, the link from Zoom. So I know Madeline's working hard in the background to, to make sure we, uh, we get all the participants. We have 32 total right now. So thank you for joining. Um, this uh, uh, Soil Organic Carbon MRV Hackathon, um, and we will be placing you into, uh, into breakout groups uh, after we hear from Chandra uh, Shakar Zinha from the World Bank about the finance community needs. Um, and, um, and I wanna make sure everyone understands we will be using the AFRIS platform that four per thousand uh, per mil uh, has established for this and uh, in each of the breakout groups, we, we have a, a designated facilitator, a note taker, resource people, finance experts, and, and others who are going to hopefully everyone actively participating in these deep dives. So the term hackathon, uh, as you probably all know, is part of the sort of common lexicon that we all use, and it really emerged from hackers, the white hat hackers, the good good guy hackers being asked to come together to collectively try to hack into an organization was the original uh, use of that term. And it's now become more broadly used to um, basically signal the intent to sort of brainstorm and, and, uh, and, and try to uh, come up with new ideas. And today's session is really uh, to give all of you hackers a chance to understand at a deeper level, a deep, deeper discussion about uh, the various tools, uh, both measurement and accounting design. So those are the, we had originally had four breakout groups, but we, we, we uh, quickly switched in and went to two. So in the, in the measurement uh, 
group, uh, you know, will be looking at, uh, it was previously remote sensing model-based uh, acti and activity-based uh, methodologies. So all of you who are more technically oriented will be in that group. And those of you who are more um, sort of looking at the broader picture will be in the accounting design group, which had previously been accounting innovations and cross-cutting uh, innovations. So, um, so that's the sort of basic thrust. And, the, and then the theme of hackathon, um, uh, you know, we're not going to be breaking into anybody's system, but uh, hopefully we'll be coming up with good ideas in the next session, which will be focused on uh, four specific projects. And this is really in, intended to give all of you who will hopefully all be joining us in the second session, um, some deeper understanding of the possibilities. On the session last week, one of the themes that emerged was uh, from a couple of the speakers was not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh, and uh, I would also want to add to that notion uh, that there is a, a good enough. Uh, we need to focus on what's going to be good enough for the finance uh, community. So I want you to keep those thoughts in mind, not le letting the perfect be the enemy of the good, but what's really good enough to have capital start to flow into uh, in soil uh, organic carbon accounting and, and, and in particular uh, capital um, to uh, accelerate uh, all of the work, good work that is needed to, uh, to meet the, the Paris goals. Um, so um, let's see, um, I, my, I will be floating. So if you see me join into a group uh, or my colleague Madeline, uh, don't be disturbed. We're just trying to make sure everything's going well. Uh, I mentioned the table roles, the AFRIS platform, uh, mostly the note takers will be using that, but at some point the note takers might ask you to make sure you're looking at the screens or sharing the screen of what they're producing in terms of the notes and the facilitators know well about how to shift your discussion. Uh, we will be in breakout groups after, after we hear from Mr. Sinha uh, from, uh, from 1025 to 1110. Uh, we'll take a break. During that break, the note takers and facilitators will be preparing the presentations that will report back from 11.25 to 11.35, five minutes per table per breakout group. And then we have a good solid 20 minutes discussion uh, during which we're gonna ask those of you who are not in the other group, is there anything missing or in the presentation, if you were in that group, if there's anything you wanna highlight that wasn't in the presentation and making sure we kind of all get a level playing field to to go to the second uh, of these two private uh, by invitation only hackathon sessions building on the webinar, which was attended by about 500 people as I, as I understand it. Um, so with that, let me just see if there's, oh, I, we're, let me just do, uh, I wonder if all of the participants, maybe I get the support staff to turn your video off. And if all of the participants can uh, turn your video on for a moment, I just wanna uh, get a raise of hands about uh, the different kinds of expertise that we have here. So all of those of you, so let's also make sure your video, when you're in the breakout group, we really would urge you to have your video on so we can have as much interaction in this virtual setting as possible. Um, but let me just get a raise of hand uh, of those of you who are involved in, uh, in, in measurement, technical uh, accounting, activities, um, be that uh, activity-based or modeling-based, but any kind of form of measuring. Just raise your, your hand, if you would. Okay, there's a couple. All right, how many of you are involved in, uh, in finance? Uh, actually, you know, moving resources and assessing the capabilities of technical systems to uh, to uh, channel resources to uh, carbon, uh, soil carbon uh, uh, sequestering activities. Please raise your hand. I see one on my screen. I, we can't all fit on the same screen, but um, great. I know there are others. And how many people are involved in projects and programs as opposed to actual finance? Um, please raise your hands. There we go. Great. So you can see, uh, and, and some of you have raised your hand for, for one or more of those, and that's fine. Um, that's great. I know uh, expertise is not uh, limited, in, uh, and we're appreciative of the kinds of the breadth and, and the types of uh, expertise that are here. So 
I think we're ready uh, to go to uh, Chandra to provide some comments about uh, the needs of the finance sector. Chandra? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Tim. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk to you a bit about the uh, uh, needs of the finance community. As a little bit of a background, I, I've been working in the carbon markets uh, uh, for the last uh, uh, 20, 20 plus years at the World Bank, and I've also uh, worked for a few years at the investment bank, uh, looking at uh, environmental products as well. Uh, uh, and what I wanted to do was to uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, what the needs uh, of the finance community uh, will be as you think in terms of the uh, accounting uh, methodologies and the MRBs. And I think uh, Tim and uh, uh, indicated and others had uh, indicated earlier as well that uh, there is a good enough. But uh, when you're looking at carbon markets, uh, uh, it's uh, important to understand, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 what is good enough and how you can potentially uh, move discussion forward because the intent is to uh, catalyze uh, uh, capital flowing into uh, measures to improve, improve soil health. and. Uh, what is uh, clearly uh, been said is that uh, uh, the opportunity of using result-based finance, specifically carbon markets, uh, to increase the capital flow or catalyze increased amount of capital flow uh, into uh, measures or programs that achieve that is going to be very important. And uh, what has happened is that over the past few years, uh, there's been a lot of interest on looking at removals as opposed to removals of greenhouse gases as opposed to uh, reduction or avoidance of greenhouse gases as uh, uh, the goals of uh, net zero have become more and more evident. And, and carbon markets have evolved over the last few years to reflect uh, the changing priorities of corporates, of uh, sovereigns as well. So I, what I wanted to do in my presentation is to give you a sense of uh, what uh, that evolution is, what buyers and investors are looking for, and then conclude with a few thoughts on what uh, um, uh, could be the way forward in defining accounting uh, methodologies and MRV systems uh, uh, to achieve the goal of catalyzing investment. So next slide, please, Madeline. Uh, fr uh, from the perspective of uh, uh, overall evolution of the market, I think uh, uh, many of you are aware that, uh, uh, you know, over the last few years, there's been a greater push towards uh, what is called a net zero target um, uh, uh, that is there in the Paris Agreement that uh, uh, we should achieve to become uh, net zero in terms of greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 2050. And that is increasingly uh, being converted into uh, uh, you know, sovereign goals and targets. There are, uh, there are country, uh, countries which have uh, uh, proposed this, uh, either uh, adopted that in legislations or, or there are legislations uh, that are being planned and converted into what are called uh, uh, using what are called the nationally determined contribution. And uh, these are basically driving uh, uh, what we call carbon pricing mechanisms, either emission trading systems or carbon taxes. And uh, each of those systems in many instances allow the use of carbon offsets. Uh, but the more important driver for, um, uh, for carbon offsets right now is the commitment by the corporate sector to achieve net zero goals and to um, move uh, uh, to um, uh, sequestration activities or, or activities around uh, land use or forestry in order to um, uh, create offsets which can, which can be utilized. And, and uh, effectively, the market uh, currently is of the order of $200 billion a year uh, for, uh, for a range of climate uh, carbon pricing uh, uh, schemes. And, and a, a good source for those who are interested in delving into the background is reflected in the slide there, which is the state and trends of the carbon uh, pricing that the World Bank brings out every year and the last one was released just about two months ago. Next slide, please. Uh, if, you, if you look at what's been happening over the past uh, uh, few years, I, I will not go into what is referred to as the Kyoto market, what happened uh, till about 2012 uh, uh, in the period that the Kyoto Protocol was in force. But to, uh, uh, for our purpose, it's more important to see what the evolution 
is or has been uh, over the past few years. And, and you begin to see that uh, uh, there are about 15,000 uh, activities which generate carbon offsets and the uh, cumulative amount that has been generated now is about uh, 4 billion tons. Uh, but over the last four or five years, there's a shift towards the uh, voluntary market or the use of independent standards. And you see the growth of uh, uh, verified carbon standards that Vera uh, produces. And I, I think, uh, you know, Vera uh, has made a presentation uh, during the main webinar uh, series, uh, uh, but they continue to be, uh, uh, you know, dominant in the, uh, in the space of uh, creating uh, carbon offsets and, and standards. And it will be important to recognize that because uh, uh, you know, the uh, methodologies and the MRV systems that are being thought of, particularly for the voluntary market sector, need to take those methodolo that methodology in account and to try to understand what are the ways in which you could improve those methodologies or move it uh, towards uh, 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 towards an approach that is uh, uh, that is useful. Uh, uh, clearly, uh, you know there are about twenty uh, standards. Many of these uh, also are working on uh, on uh, methodologies for soil uh, carbon accounting, climate action reserve, ACR are two other important ones. I think gold standard is also thinking in terms of doing so. So those of you who are interested in the uh, um, uh, in the independent standards themselves, uh, uh, you should note that uh, uh, in terms of scale, VCS gold standard uh, or VERA gold standard, um, uh, climate action reserve are the key ones uh, to, uh, to uh, focus on. Uh, I think uh, the other thing to remember uh, from a broad perspective of the carbon market is to uh, recognize that uh, uh, it, over the next five, seven years, it is going to be the corporate-based voluntary uh, uh, market to offset footprints, which is going to uh, dominate in terms of the uh, uh, overall uh, uh, demand that will be created. Uh, this is pri primarily for people who, uh, uh, next slide please, sorry. Uh, uh, the next slide is primarily for people who really want to delve into the details uh, of, uh, uh, of what exactly has happened in the carbon market. The Sankey diagram indicates for you uh, uh, the full uh, uh, amount of uh, uh, offsets that have been generated by the 20 odd uh, standards and uh, the top one, the CDM, uh, was for the compliance market for the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, 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 as was the case of the JI, but the others uh, indicate to you the full range of activities that has occurred in the, in the uh, offset market. And you note that uh, renewable energy and the industrial gases have dominated uh, the generation of the offsets. But uh, over the last uh, five years, over 40% of the uh, offsets have come from the forestry and the land use sector. Uh, so uh, it also gives you a sense of, uh, you know, uh, where these uh, offsets are generated uh, more of as a background information than anything else. And, and to give you a sense of uh, how the market has behaved over the last uh, uh, decade or so. Next slide, please. So uh, with that uh, background on the carbon market, uh, let me just give you a, a quick uh, a summary of what uh, the voluntary uh, buyers are looking for and what their expectations and concerns are. I think very clearly one has to be aware of the fact that uh, 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 most corporate buyers in the, uh, uh, who are in the market to offset their footprint are concerned about reputational risk, uh, particularly with regard to the accusation of potentially greenwashing their footprint with uh, offsets uh, uh, that are of questionable quality. Uh, there's certainly uh, a concern of uh, uh, a stakeholder and institutional investor criticism and concern. And of course, uh, uh, they are also very concerned about the ability of uh, activities that they are involved in delivering the required amount of offset. Uh, you know, because if uh, if you're looking for commitment and financing uh, uh, prior to those offsets actually being generated, that becomes a big concern. In terms of uh, uh, what is particularly attractive for uh, potential buyers and investors, it's. Uh, 
uh, it's the fact that uh, they are associated with uh, uh, best practice. They are associated with uh, uh, very uh, compelling stories of social and community uh, type impacts. Uh, they certainly are looking for innovation and uniqueness. And of course, uh, uh, all corporate buyers are looking for value for money. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, no big surprises for anyone who's been involved in this, but to recognize that while you're defining what is good enough, you need to take into account the fact that uh, uh, reputational risk uh, of the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, of the emission reductions not occurring is a big part of the concern uh, with which uh, uh, you know every sector is viewed and the land use sector is clearly uh, uh, you know because of lack of fam familiarity uh, has been uh, uh, of concern uh, with that regard next slide please so uh, in terms of the uh, you know uh, learning from uh, what uh, the buyers have uh, uh, been doing in the carbon market over the last decade or so. Uh, uh, what, what are the specific lessons for, uh, 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 for the soil carbon based offsets? So very clearly, uh, uh, the robustness of uh, 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 accounting standards, uh, accounting methodologies and MRV would be very important. It would be extremely important to emphasize in the communication uh, as to how uh, uh, how um, uh, uh, the, uh, sorry team, I'll try to uh, speed up. Uh, 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 so uh, it will be important to uh, emphasize how net zero goals of the Paris Agreement uh, are um, promoted through the use uh, of offsets from the soil carbon mechanism and certainly the independent in, uh, endorsement and the approaches uh, becomes an important part of it as well. So now I come to the real part of it and I am sorry I took a little longer than uh, uh, anticipated but I thought it's uh, use, it may be useful for you to understand the underlying market. So most of you are uh, very, very familiar with uh, uh, the accounting methodologies based on the show of hands. So uh, I thought maybe the finance part may be the, where I can add value. So on the methodology side, what is very clear is that the internationally peer reviewed methodologies uh, which have been adopt adapted uh, um, uh, for uh, the purpose of uh, uh, independent standard or building on the independent standards uh, have to be the starting points. Uh, uh, very clearly, uh, the MRV is where the uh, uh, highest costs are incurred, and so the use of uh, 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 you know technology, uh, uh, which uh, possibly was not available a, a decade ago, uh, becomes a critical part of it. And how do you use remote sensing technologies? How do you use sensors? How do you uh, use connected systems uh, uh, to uh, build a MRV system which is cost effective to ensure quality of the uh, uh, um, uh, outcome or reduction uh, through soil carbon measures and to uh, utilize third party uh, assessment processes for the um, uh, for the generated uh, mitigation outcomes. And finally, uh, what is very, very important is that this has to be placed within a broader institutional context and that the MRV and the uh, accounting standard and the MRV that you put in place needs to operate within uh, the developing country environment with uh, uh, weak capacities and institutional uh, and institutions. So th that is an important part to recognize as well. Next slide, please. I think uh, uh, several speakers during the webinar uh, indicated and and Sinero sum summarized uh, and team summarized uh, uh, the the spirit that I heard was that uh, the methodologies, the accounting methodologies, and uh, the MRV should be fit for purpose, uh, and and uh, the purpose that we are looking at is catalyzing. Uh, investments uh, and and in this specific instance uh, through the utilization of the carbon market. So I think uh, uh, the key criteria that uh, the methodologies must have is that they must be uh, scalable. Uh, uh, you know, you should look at uh, managing costs through uh, having uh, working at a program level, at the potentially landscape level. Uh, that you uh, look at accuracy uh, um, in the context of the impact 
and the result that you wish to achieve. Uh, and uh, and uh, these obviously uh, have, will have an impact uh, on the cost and you can manage these through uh, innovative sampling or, or, or more, uh, more systematic sampling uh, uh, in some sense and, and to recognize that the MRV and the uh, methodology uh, with which it is associated should evolve over time as you uh, uh, as you get uh, a greater level of uh, uh, iteration or you have more data and 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 you improve uh, uh, the results and the outcomes next slide please so uh, in terms of in terms of a summary uh, sorry I, uh, uh, next slide uh, in the interest of time let me just go to the next slide uh, so in terms of uh, uh, summarizing and concluding this, I think uh, uh, you know, uh, it is important to emphasize that there is a great level of interest in uh, uh, looking at uh, soil organic carbon as a carbon offset in the context of the net zero goals. Uh, uh, and uh, it is also very clear based on assessments that uh, soil or organic carbon improvement can play a very important role in meeting the net zero uh, goals. Uh, and uh, that uh, uh, what we need to move towards are uh, fit for purpose methodologies which are scalable, ac accurate and evolve over time. And to recognize that uh, perhaps uh, in many uh, circumstances, many country circumstances, that you may not be able to go straight away to market grade me methodologies, as we call it, um, methodologies would, uh, uh, which could support uh, uh, or which could lead to offsets being taken into the uh, into the carbon market. And in such instances, it is worthwhile for those who are designing these projects to consider uh, uh, a result-based uh, approach or an out, uh, uh, approach based on activity payments and utilize that to create uh, uh, an MRV system uh, which can evolve into a market grade methodology and, and benefit from the incentives of the carbon market. So uh, it, there may be circumstances in many developing countries where uh, you may not be able to uh, uh, go straight away to access the carbon market, but when you're, when you're designing activities and MRV system to take an evolutionary process in mind so that two or three years down the line, as you have more and more information, uh, that the methodology can withstand the scrutiny of third party uh, 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 assessment according to an independent standard and therefore can access the market. So let me stop here. Uh, uh, over to you, Tim. Okay, thank you so much. Wonderful uh, presentation, Shonda, very helpful. Um, I hope others found it to be as well. Um, we are behind our scheduled time, so we're gonna put you right into breakout groups. But before we do, I just wanna ask Madeline, my colleague, to put her email address in the chat box. And Conrad, can you do the same, please? So Madeline, if you have any technical issues, you can private chat to either Madeline or Conrad for Madeline for any Zoom challenges you're having and Conrad for any challenges that you're having regarding getting onto the AFRA site and making use of the AFRA site. So, um, so Madeline, you've done so. Conrad, please put your email address, but you can also access both of them via a private chat uh, when you're in the breakout groups uh, and, uh, and we'll go from there. So without further ado, um, and the facilitators, maybe we can make up a little bit of time by uh, doing the intros when people make their first introduction, have them introduce themselves um, so we can try to build, uh, make back some of the time that we have lost here. So, um, so without, and you're, you've already been assigned to a breakout group. So as soon as I, I'm done here and I, I give Madeline the okay, we're going to go, she's going to put you right into those breakout groups. Okay. Thank you. We'll, uh, we'll see you on the other end of the breakouts with report outs. Thank you very much. So Tim, I didn't put you in a breakout yet. And Braulio, is he uh, assigned? Should be. Um, yeah. Okay. Great. So, whew, my my, lesson <laughs> learned on this registration thing. Yeah. Oh God. I mean, I just rely completely on the calendar myself. So. Um, uh, yeah, it's complicated to. I would wonder next time if we did like a waiting room, if that yeah. would be better. And then I just. I wonder if we should pause the recording here. 
Lenny, why don't you go ahead first, and then we'll go with Paul, and then we'll open it up for discussion here. And you're on mute still. Let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Great. Okay. So um, we, for the vision of, of this approach, um, suggested a mix of measurement modeling and activity data, which is probably something the other group came up with as well, but noting that it should be optimally cost effective and accurate. So figuring out the right mix. Um, second was the landscape level rather than uh, necessarily a project or farm level to distribute the permanence and cost risks across different land uses. Um, an emphasis on the need for activity, ultimately activity data and, and land use activity data specifically as the proxy for, for solar organic carbon if we really want to make this cheap. Um, it was noted that we want to link, we want to not just measure uh, soil carbon, but we want to link it to things like water and biodiversity because that increases the value of the carbon credit um, and also will have benefits for farmers. Um, and then the um, uh, mechanism of using a buffer on the value of a carbon credit has been well tested, so we thought that also should be part of the vision. And finally, to also reduce costs and deal with the issue of small, um, many smallholders, the need for aggregated approaches to measurement. So, so that's the overall vision. The finance community um, indicated there was a need to um, identify immediate benefits for farmers in order to support the farmer change um, in whatever system we develop. There's also a need to distribute the cost of accounting for soil carbon with other benefits that soil carbon provides and to not just assume that that MRV should be carried entirely by a carbon credit. Um, that baseline, we need some indication ahead of time for projects to know what the risk is of the carbon price that's involved so they know whether to even engage in measurement and engage it in this price. So some indication of the threshold of the carbon price necessary to make a project viable. Um, and it was noted that storing carbon is, is like storing uh, uh, something in a warehouse and you get paid a rent for doing so. So how can we make sure that there is a rent paid um, for the enterprises that are, are storing soil carbon? And finally, a really important point that the finance market can deal with uncertainty, we just have to bracket it. We just have to explain what that uncertainty is and that we have evidence for really high uncertainty in some markets. Um, and that's okay, as long as, again, the uncertainties are known. So what are some of the next, um, next steps? First is the need for a critical mass of proven cases. So suggesting pilots with action research to document them. Um, the need for a uh, much bigger, better, uh, wider environmental database, especially for developing country contexts and the ability to share that information, um, especially information at soil depth and, and uh, prioritizing sampling in order to achieve that environmental database. Um, we need a data ethics framework that allows uh, farmers um, to protect their own rights to information about their activities and their soil. And for low and middle income countries, uh, we should be identifying where priorities are, um, stratifying, I mean, this is true globally, but because of the need to invest more in making these systems happen in low and middle income countries where it might not be affordable by farmers directly, how can we stratify to focus our efforts and, and, and show the domains of applicability of the data that is derived in those places? That's all. I'm not sure if anybody else would like to comment from our group. Anybody from the group want to highlight something or add something that wasn't included in Lenny's presentation? And Tim, if I may, we do have an, about 25 other points. Right. I just tried to summarize the highlights here. Right. So uh, those notes are available on the AFRA site. Right, and, and we'll certainly make use of them in preparation for the next session, but I'm not hearing anybody speak up from the group. Um, I'm gonna ask the other group um, to respond to what's missing, what. You are you confused, but in the interest of time here, and apologize, the whole thing has seemed a bit rushed here, but I'm gonna suggest that Paul report out and then we have an open discussion on both of the presentations here. Paul, go ahead, please. Well, thank you, but you know, um, listening to Lini, I think most of the point that we, we, uh, we have also discussed in our group is already picked up in the report that Lini did. 
the things maybe that we can mention is the fact that uh, uh, we, we make a little bit of difference between the different uh, techniques and approach, uh, the activity data, the modeling and remote sensing. And one of the things that uh, people said for concerning the activity data is the, the advantage of um, replacing uh, those information in the history of the, of the, the, the area considered. Is it a plot or is it a, a large area for the project? We need to know what's happened there before and then what's going on also uh, since the beginning of the project. And we, we've been through the, the different uh, advantage and, in, and um, problems, problematic with all the different approaches. But roughly, it's exactly the same idea that uh, Lini uh, share with us. And um, I can insist on the fact that uh, people also said that uncertainty for the financial community is not uh, bearable. I mean, they, we really need to, to uh, remove that uncertainty because people say more certainty is equal to more credit, more carbon credit. So it means that uncertainty is not bearable for, for the financial part. And the relationship with the farmers is also very important. And when we create synergy with the farmers, we, we get a better, better data. So um, no, nothing more to add to that because I think it's already there in the in linear report. We can mix up the, the different report at the end, but we will find the same conclusion. Okay, does anybody in, in that group want to add to or elaborate on, on Paul's presentation? Not really a presentation, sorry. <laughs> well, we have on the screen, you can absorb what's there. Um, let me ask folks, um, click on your participant icon in the Zoom and you'll see um, not only the list of participants, but the raise hand function. I'm hoping we can engage in some dialogue here, particularly those of you who are engaged in finance about this good enough question. So um, Chandra, you were the one who led the presentation. I'm wondering how you're reacting to what you're hearing from these breakout groups. And I'm going to encourage others who are involved in finance to speak up as well. Uh, I, I think the uh, broader point that was made uh, of uh, finance sector uh, being able to manage uncertainties and, and risks of that nature uh, is true. I, uh, uh, you know, the point in our breakout group was that weather insurance uh, has thrived over the years despite the lack of certainty uh, on the prediction. The, the challenge, of course, is that it reflects on the pricing. Uh, uncertainty is addressed uh, through uh, 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 through a, a discount on the price, uh, or uh, physically in the, uh, in terms of discount on the volume. So uh, clearly, I mean, uh, it's not that it is a, uh, a, a it is a, it is something that is a, a make or break, uh, but it certainly it, uh, affects the attractiveness of the way it is done. One of the, and one of the ways that uh, we've been thinking about it, which we talked about in our breakout group, uh, was the idea of uh, looking at uh, a longer term uh, dividend kind of an approach where you manage, pool a lot of that risk together and make payments over time, uh, addressing those uncertainties or once those uncertainties are uh, uh, addressed, I think, rather than uh, uh, you know, a fixed payment uh, uh, every year based on uh, on the volume and the price at that point of time. Uh, pool it over time as well, not just uh, in a, ge uh, a geospatial sense. Uh, uh, so uh, that does allow for uh, 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 greater certainty in terms of the way potentially you could design the actual business model. Uh, uh, certainly as far as a new area such as uh, improvement of soil health to sequester carbon is concerned. And, uh, and we've seen that happen in, in, in the forest landscape. Uh, perhaps uh, there, there is learning to be had there as to how over time you've managed uh, some of those uncertainties and risks and improved the uh, 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 MRV system through the use of uh, uh, you know, landscapes and, and new technology. So I'll, I'll stop there. Great. Let me encourage others to speak up and otherwise I'm going to maybe call on some folks to reflect on what you've heard from these breakout groups. Deborah, I was going to call on you. So thank you. <laughs> well, I actually have a small, a small thing, not like a really smart, like summary thing right now, but I was just surprised in what Paul just presented where he said, um, 
activity-based measurements are preferable. And I was just really shocked at that because I thought that, that we're actually thinking the other way around, that we want more certainty and more actual accounting me measurements. So I, I, I'd like to hear a bit more. Yeah, he's going to clarify. It looks like he was shaking his head no. So go ahead, Paul. Oh, he didn't say that. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, he um, didn't say that. The, the, the people said that the, the most, uh, I mean, the easiest way is the, what Dan called a hybrid approach. It is, means measurements and modeling. And with the help of remote sensing on the top, it would be the best. But at the moment, it seems that the best solution would be a, a mixture of uh, modeling and measurement. So that means activity, activity based data and uh, modeling. Sorry if I was not clear. Today is the end of the day and my English is not improving. <laughs> no, no, it, I think it was actually in the written comment I misunderstood. So the, the written part. But thank, thank you for that. Sorry for that little distraction. And then the other thing I, I, that I noticed here that I would like us, we don't have time to consider it, but as I'm listening, I'm hearing a lot of individual things about solutions and possibilities and, and finance needs. Is there any way to prioritize or put them in any kind of order? Like what would be the first thing that's got to happen? Or what would be the one first that nothing else will work if we don't do that? Or uh, and, and Deborah, just to be clear, you're you're thinking about this in a kind of global macro kind of scale, right? I mean, generally speaking, right? Yeah, I'm thinking from from Chandra's point of view, for example, if 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 there's you know a list of a whole bunch of things that we want to do to improve the accounting so that we can unlock this market, is there one thing that has to come first, or are they all equally important? Or is there any way to strategize? You know, what should we be tackling with most vigor right at this very moment and what can come next? And thinking that. Okay, Debbie uh, Reed wants to get in and maybe if someone, if anybody wants to react to what Deborah's asking, please do. But Debbie, I'm not sure you knew the question was coming, so go ahead. Thank you, I actually wanted to react to what um, Deborah Bossier was saying is I agree that prioritizing this is really important. Um, I, that's, I think part of the thing is like, what is the vision? Where do we want to get in say five years and how do we get there? And I would suggest one way to think about it is we're not going to be able to do everything everywhere. It, we have some data rich environments and some that are less so. And you might want to make sure that the two visions eventually cross there, right? So if you consider all of the data that you can capture in an industrialized country setting, for instance, where you have more resources, more ability to do that, and um, build a vision towards what you can do in countries where there is less data, so that ultimately over time, we're actually building towards the same point and the same um, level of uh, knowledge, if you will, would be really important. And you can do that with you know, a, a good thought process in terms of building the infrastructure, the framework, um, and then moving towards it, perhaps at a different pace or at different um, scales. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, Claire, do you have a thought? It looks like you do. Go ahead. Uh, yes, I think that um, the, the approach that has the most unexplored potential is remote sensing. It would allow to have high throughput information. And so to improve the quality of information on uh, activity and, to, um, and even on, on soil carbon contents. So I would, put, in terms of developing new things, I would put the priority on there. Modeling, there's a lot of, it can be improved, but it's already ongoing. So I think the potential is in remote sensing for innovation. Thank you very much. Alden, go ahead, please. Um, I, I like everything everybody has just said. Um, I'm wondering if some of us might like to work together on getting back to sort of really looking at first principles and learning from what we've all tried over the last 30 years and two things come to mind. Can we, it would be really neat to really talk about accounting. Like when someone sells real interest in a minus one in their inventory, what do they have to report publicly? If I, if I wanted to sell shares in my company to, to the public, I would have to produce financial reports and keep publishing them over time. If I'm selling real interest in a change in my inventory, should I have to also publish the inventory version of a financial report? Like, like, like the really basic uh, accounting questions that I don't think we started to ask yet. That's the first thing. And the second thing is I wonder if we need to step back 
and ask ourselves um, if we should be revisiting some of the ways we have so far defined that digital asset, digital environmental asset we call an offset credit. So for example, at this moment, we live in a world that if I own a power plant and I, we, and I burn less coal, um, I get credit for having created a permanent emission reduction, even if the coal that I didn't burn still comes out of the ground and gets burnt by somebody else. So if I'm a, a large emitter, I don't have any obligation to trace my claim back to the carbon and prove that it stayed in storage as opposed to going up. But if I'm drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere through the process of photosynthesis, I don't get any credit unless I actually prove that the carbon stayed in the ground. Those are inconsistent def definitions of the digi digital asset. So how do we get to some consistency? Okay, thank you for that. We have just a couple minutes before I'm gonna to turn to Linny for a wrap up here. Linny, I, I'm assuming you still would like five minutes. Um, three, two, two or three. Okay, well, let's keep this going here. It's, uh, we're gaining some, regaining some momentum here from uh, this rather harried uh, first session here, but other comments uh, based on what you heard in the breakout group report outs and what you're hearing now. Uh, Alden's already done, so let me take her hand down. Anybody else, please? I'm sure there are other thoughts that you're having. Please share them. Conrad has his hand up. Go ahead, Conrad. Yeah, sorry, I didn't find this uh, hand up function, so I did do it physically. Yeah, I was, um, I think one very important point, which I kind of uh, um, noticed during our discussion is that we have, I mean, the most accurate thing is, of course, a measurement based um, monitoring system. And one, if we look at the situation in Europe, I mean, most of the initiatives that are actually um, producing or offering um, the issuance of carbon uh, credits, they are actively measuring. And they can do so because, um, for example, in Germany, the farmers are obliged to do certain soil measurements every year, and it's not a lot, a lot of cost, additional cost to measure carbon. So we're quite accurate. Now, we look at the, the states, I have the impression the system is already much more model-based or, well, remote sense and model-based and not so directly measurement-based. But then if we go one step ahead into the tropics, actually, we don't have direct measurements. We don't have accurate uh, remote sensing data and we have to rely on this mere activity based data so i think one crucial point is and if we think about scaling up the whole this whole issue and if we think about this financing community that wants to invest also in developing countries in the global south then at the moment we only have this activity based approach and we have to really put effort on a better understanding of the dynamics in the tropics and in developing countries. Thank you. Similar point to Debbie's, it seems to me. Um, uh, Pete, you came off video, onto your video. Did you have a comment you want to make? No, but I fully agree with uh, Conrad, right? This is a, is a key issue. And then I had a question which I actually asked Lenny, but then maybe I can ask everybody here, right? If I look and the studies I've been involved with myself in tropical soils, right, it's often actually about, you know, do a lot of hard work, you know, organic matter, not to, whatever, to basically maintain, right, uh, soil carbon levels. And actually, if you screw up a bit, you lose. So, I mean, in the end, right, it's not often even about, you know, building up, but it's actually, you know, how can we stay as high as possible by working very hard? So my question would just be, is that good enough, you know, in a marketplace? Is that something that can actually attract uh, credit? Are people really interested in that? It's a different question maybe, you know, but of course for me, when it comes to uncertainty and already, you know, you're close to the equilibrium and you just wanted to vote it to drop. I mean, then of course, you know, it's a different story than when you build, you know, up from a degraded soil and you make it a nice rich pasture and you can really build up over 10, 20 years in a temperate climate. That's a very different story. Yeah. Okay. Can I, can I just quickly ask for clarification on that? Because um, it seems to me that proper baselines should be able to account for that because if, if it's decreasing and you stop it, you're actually getting a benefit. Is that not an option in these projects? I actually don't know. Anybody have a view on that? Lenny, go ahead. Yeah, could I ask for the people who do deal, who do, do soil crediting now, do you use a, a baseline or a base year? 
uh, I can start to answer that. We use a baseline. It would be great if the markets would acknowledge whether the uh, original baseline is actually decreasing or increasing in the rate of change, right? If we could actually account for the true delta as opposed to where we start, um, that would be huge, right? But that's, a, I think, a different approach that, um, you know, I think we can focus on and iterate over time because the issue of losing soil carbon is at least as, as important as ensuring that we're increasing soil carbon, right? Yeah. And so protecting stocks and maintaining them. Excellent. Alden, I see you came off a mute. Go ahead, please. This is interesting because um, Deb Reed and I were both in a conversation just a couple of days ago about this, where I was um, suggesting an exercise that I, I, I'd like us to do is take a single project and then just, we don't have to go through, you know, too much work, but just show that one ton is not the same. Um, uh, does not represent the same thing if you take the same project through, say, the soil enrichment, the proposed soil enrichment protocol in the Vera registry, or the soil enrichment protocol in the CAR registry, or Nori's um, quantification method, because each uh, 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 one ton removed or reduced, emission reduced, is a relative number and everybody defines baseline differently. So it is not the case that one ton equals one ton equals one ton. And I'd love to do some work and, and, and just see what the, the differences are that derive from taking the same pro project through different protocols that have all been long time approved or are about to be approved. That are all, none of them are illegitimate ways of defining baselines, they're just different. And, and, and the differences have huge implications. Okay, thank you for that exchange. Um, I'm gonna to turn to Lenny here to, to, to wrap us up here in, uh, in two minutes, Lenny, as you uh, asked for it. Thank you. I wish we had a whole day and I wish we were able to meet in person. Let me just start off by saying that. But clearly people have put on the table quite a few ideas, uh, some of which are well known, some of which are new, um, but converging around this idea of some kind of a hybrid approach and I feel like now we're starting to pick out, you know, the, the gaps and the areas where we really need to pay some attention for vision for future accounting method. We're going to store all of that in the notes and AFRIS and, and we'll try to bring that together. And I think we will think of some kind of follow on event in addition to next Thursday. But for next Thursday, we're really hoping that people can take this common knowledge of what's possible and what's needed by the finance community now to look at four projects, two from the World Bank, one in Niger, one in Kazakhstan, one from um, the TNC in Colombia, and one from the four per mil, which is on a host of different sites, um, and to apply these tools to work out a practical method, right? So we're gonna take all of this vision and hope and bring it down to something concrete and actionable, um, we hope next week. We are going to talk in the facilitation team about how to make all of the technical work better and send you the link in a, a, you know, the day of the meeting or the day before the meeting and try to just smooth out some of the wrinkles that happened today. I apologize for that. Um, and we look forward to a good discussion next week. So keep your hack hats ready and uh, we'll, we'll proceed again next week with more fun. <laughs>